You know, doing satire in Canada isn't always easy, and south of the border, there's no shortage of big, easy targets. But see, here home, making fun of ourselves has grown into a more subtle art, and thankfully, we've got artists like Don Ferguson and the Royal Canadian Air Force. It is safe to say that Air Force is an institution launched on CBC Radio back in 73. The show is a mix of political and cultural comedy with a distinct Canadian flavor. A. Ladies and gentlemen, the Royal Canadian Air Force. And alongside Dave Broadfoot, Luba Goy, John Morgan, and his childhood friend, the late great Roger Abbott, Don went from being a shy photographer to a gifted entertainer. Just call me the Dirk Diggler of Canadian politics. And when the show moved to a regular spot on CBC television in 1993, Don was at the top of his game, impersonating everyone from Pierre Trudeau to Dylan. <laughs> Air Force became a water cooler hit watched by millions, and by the time it ended its weekly run in 2008, being skewered on the show had become a point of pride. Big show, lots going on, I'm cool. Even if it meant being shot by the chicken cannon, these days Don is continuing the tradition. He's preparing a brand new Air Force New Year special, carrying on the legacy of the group without two of its founding members. And he's got a new book as well. It's called Air Farce, 40 Years of Flying by the Seat of Our Pants, co-written by Roger. It's an insider's look, the show that made audiences laugh and politicians just a little nervous. Stephen Harper will take time to do important personal things like accessorizing my study or just kicking back with a non-fat decaf mocha latte and listening to my Village People CDs. Don Ferguson, everybody. How are you? I'm great, thank you. <laughs> Welcome back. Good to be back. Good to have you. It must be, um, must be interesting, you know, Air Force is this all-consuming force in your life mm -hmm. for so long, and then to, to do the New Year special, to do it when it's not a daily all-consuming force, what's that been like? It's, uh, it's, it's like starting, having to start all over again every year. Uh, when, we, when we stopped the series, I felt like Wiley e. Coyote, uh, you know, running off the edge of the cliff. Because yeah, well, we you know what it's like. You're going full speed all yeah. the time, even though you know the last show is coming up in two weeks, in one week, and then it's over, and you're still running, and it's just poof, no ground underneath you. Right. Yeah. So, psh. how did you how did you handle that fall? Like, uh, not literally the fall, but how did you handle the, the fall? The, um, it was uh, uh, this. I'm, I'm warning you, just because it may happen to you one day too. Yeah. You know? oh, no, it will. <laughs> There's no may, buddy. <laughs> And I won't get the run you did. <laughs> you had a great run. Well, you never know. No, it was, it's, uh, I found a, a kind of at a, at a loss uh, with what to do with my time. And I actually found that I got a little depressed because I was, for the first time in my life, I had no reason to get up in the morning and do anything. You know, right. it was like, well, this is weird. And the, I, I, I found my brain started going. Like, I, I had trouble remembering things. And I thought, it, why does it take me all day to read the newspaper? I suppose that's kind of normal, but I, I found I didn't like it. And uh, uh, I was really glad that CBC had given us the opportunity to come back and do another uh, New Year's special the following year, because at least it was something I could look forward to and we could say, that's coming up. Yeah, you know? here, let's play, here's a clip from the New Year's special. Incoming, Code Red. I've never seen anything like this before. It's the riot kissing couple. We've tried everything to unstick them. Crowbar, jaws of life, sir. Nothing can pull them apart. We need something to distract them, sir. There's only one man who can do that. You don't mean? Yes, Dr. Ron. Wow. <laughs> so that's from this year's New Year's special. This year's New Year's special, that's right. When you, um... What can we expect, aside from a great combat hospital, what can we expect? <laughs> Ron McLean is there. Uh, Ron McLean is there. Who else is there? Elizabeth May is going to come by. Awesome. We have uh, uh, an Aboriginal actor, Lauren Cardinal. We have um, Adam Beach, who's starting on CBC very Arctic soon Air. with Arctic Air. Yeah, he's on the show. Um, we have all the regular cast back. I know I'm forgetting some people. We have, like, we've got so many guests this the year. The rest is surprises. Yeah, yes, the surprises. Yes, you let this tune in to see the surprises. Thank <laughs> you. Right. You're, you're good at this. Well, you know, you know. <laughs> i got to tell you something about that clip we saw. That's Ron McLean who came in through the doors. And the, the, the bit is he sort of, he starts doing his puns, and it, the people get so distracted who are necking, they just can't, they, they get up and run away. Right. Uh, so they're cured. But the uh, um, Arnold Pinnock, who's in that scene, is, was, is actually in combat hospital. And uh, years ago, Arnold used to work here, and he was in technical. Uh, he was actually a cable puller at one time. <laughs> so he, would, he did that on our show, and he also did it on Hockey Night in Canada. So Ron hadn't seen him in, I don't know, 20, 20 years or something, and he, he walks into the set uh, beginning of last week, and he says, uh, Hi, 
Arnold, what are you doing here? You know. Did he still think he was a cable puller? Uh, had no, he no, seen no, Combat no, Hospital? No, I think he knew that Arnold had moved on. <laughs> but it was a, it was a great moment. I can yeah. imagine. It's yeah. it's also going to be. I mean, the last time you were on the chair, you were here with Roger. Yeah. When Roger had to, you know, done the interview with this, yeah. and Roger's not obviously going to be here for this. What's that experience been like? Oh, uh, that's been unbelievable. Uh, you know, Roger and I were friends for uh, more than 50 years, and we worked together for more than 40, and we were you know buddies and and really really uh, close partners. When Roger. Um, was was sick with leukemia. You were the only cast member who knew, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. That's quite a thing to carry to carry around together. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I guess because we knew each, we'd known each other so well and for so long. He was diagnosed in 1997, and really, um, his sister knew, and his niece knew, and I knew, and that was pretty much it for maybe 10 years. And then, very gradually, as his condition began to deteriorate a little bit, he let other people in on it. But even, I would say, when, when Roger died in March, uh, perhaps only. Ten people knew that he was sick, maybe a dozen wow. at tops. So that's why it was such a shock to everybody when it happened. I mean, it just, I remember being in the office on uh, uh, Sunday when we let the news out. He, he died on Saturday night. And it was like uh, there was this t just this tidal wave of, of, uh, of interest. I mean, the phone ringing, the emails. I think I had over 600 emails in wow. less than 24 hours. Well, it speaks to what Roger was able to accomplish uh, as a performer, but also what you guys did as a, as a family. Yeah, uh, in a yeah. way, over the well, years. You know, I, yeah, I don't want, this sounds all very somber, this conversation, but we had a lot of fun. You know, oh, we yes. Did, <laughs> we, had, we had 40 fabulous years. Uh, and I don't just mean Roger and I, but I mean the, the Air Force as a group. Because you, it's, you know, you can't do comedy unless you're enjoying it. It's like if you're mad or angry, and to do comedy is really difficult, especially with other people. Uh, so we always, always, always made sure that whatever happened in the daytime, we ended the day as friends. Yeah. And uh, we spent so much time touring, radio, When TV, I was reading this stage. book, dude, though, what I really liked about this Air Force book, too, is that uh, you do talk about all the good times and the great experiences, but it doesn't hide the fact that there was some stuff behind the scenes. <laughs> like Dave Rodford practically quit because of Luba being late. That's right. And, and the, the tension with you guys, like it's real. It's so that, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No. Well, I thought, you Has know. Has Luba read the book? Uh, <laughs> yes, but uh, she has, yes, but she's fine with it. Yeah, okay. yeah, because we, we, this is not like a secret that I was letting out of the bag for the first time. We all, we're, we're friendly enough and we're real enough to know that we can, we can talk about these things. All right. Uh, but it, it was, uh, it was just an extraordinary experience recreating it. It was really a privilege in a sense because I had to carry on alone after Roger died. We, we submitted the first bit of it to the, the publisher and then he was gone. And uh, it was a, really a, a great uh, privilege to be able to spend the summer looking back over uh, all the years that we, we had together. You know, and you go back and look when you're young and how much fun you had and how crazy it was. And yeah. you're thinking, oh, this is never going to last. Let's go for it while we can. You right. know? Then you find yourself 40 years later thinking, I'm still doing it. Let's, let's look at happened? a couple of pictures. I want to put a couple of pictures okay. and get your thoughts on these pictures here. So here's one back in the day of you guys. Oh, yes. So first of all, it looks like it's Getty Lee and David Crosby there. <laughs> well, actually, Roger did pay David Crosby on the TV show several times. He looks like him. Yeah. He, he could be Ellen's father. He could be the baby daddy. Here's the other one that I really like. And I, I, I'm just curious about this suit. Oh, yes. That my, my. suit is fantastic. I, I thought that suit looked really sharp. You did? <laughs> yeah. Was that for a bit, or was that your actual suit? <laughs> no, no. I, was, I, I didn't own a suit, so I had to go and buy a suit. And so I went to Lou Miles in yeah. Toronto, which is, he used to dress gangsters, I think. I don't know, but I, <laughs> this, this was, this, I looked at this pattern and, and, and I said, well, make me a suit out of this stuff. I thought it looked great. I look at, I've looked at it since and I thought, this is like a, a businessman trying to pass as a clown. You know? is, that is like a guy on 100 hits of LSD. <laughs> and the reason I bring that up was I heard, and I can't believe this to be true, but in 1967, yeah. oh, yes, did yes. You, is that how you celebrated? The well, well, everybody had Centennial Project. So I had a bunch of friends in Montreal decided we would do acid a hundred times, and uh, we did. We we only started partway through the year, so we had to finish it in '68. But we didn't do it. So you did a not not a hundred at once, obviously. You no, did, no, 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 but no. Over the course of a year, you did a hundred hits of acid. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't do it much more than once every three days because you just didn't have the effect on it. <laughs> well, no, uh, that's, just a, that's a chemistry lesson. You had to come down before you could get back up again. So, so that, that's how we did. It. <laughs> that's awesome. And every so often. And actually, every so often we'd actually miss, and then we'd have to double up. The next day. Yeah. <laughs> so. Did some of your best work come out of that one year? I don't know. <laughs> some of my best hallucinations definitely came out of that That's one year. That's fantastic. <laughs> but you know what's interesting is that, you know, that time, too, you're talking about being, especially Montreal, I mean, the FLQ crisis was, was really hot. Yeah. Uh, what, what was your re re relationship like with that? Well, um, I had just left Montreal, and the group was just leaving Montreal when the, uh, as the FLQ crisis blew up, pardon the expression. Uh, <laughs> 
they were bombers, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, in fact, there was a, one great incident happened. Was John Morgan uh, had had come to uh, Toronto. Well, a little bit of background: the FLQ had captured the uh, the British. Uh, what was he, not, the consul in Montreal, a guy named James Cross, and they were holding him for ransom. John Morgan had driven up from Montreal in, his, in a car that only John would be proud of, and uh, he was double parked outside the Spadina subway station, and a Toronto cop came over and, and said, you can't park here. And uh, John, who had an English accent, said, oh, I'm terribly sorry, I'll move the car. And the guy looked at him and said, uh, Quebec plates, can I see some ID? And so John showed him the ID, and he said, okay. And the cop turns around and goes halfway across the street, turns around and comes back and says, you're not by any pants James Cross, are you? <laughs> As a joke. And John said no, and the cop goes, just not my day. <laughs> but the, great, the great relief for John was it was so different in Toronto than, than in Montreal, where in Montreal, it was like tense all the time. And in Toronto, even cops could make jokes about it. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. All right, stick around. We're going to talk to Don about whatever happened to the chicken cannon. Anthropology <laughs> with Don Ferguson after this. <laughs>